Well, thank you all for coming on a Thursday lecture, which is still part of our magnificent series, let's see what I can say the whole title, Green, Blue, and Gray Infrastructure. So we count you the gray area. Okay, we'll do it. Yeah. Various shades right. of gray. Right. Um, so um, it's not just a regular lecture, at least for me it's a very special day because our extremely distinguished speaker is someone who I have known literally for 29 years. So Professor Jonathan Levine, uh, who is a professor at the College of Architecture and Urban Planning at the University of Michigan, joined the faculty of the University of Michigan um, in 1991. Yes. So I became a master's student at Michigan in the fall of 93, and so um, when you were new assistant professor, and by the way, you look exactly the same, uh -oh. how I remember you. Uh, so you taught quantitative methods too, uh -huh. uh, and that was how we met, and the rest is history, 29 years later, but it's really a, a remarkable, I think, achievement, uh, because actually I do not maintain contacts with people I met in the United States for the last 25 year, nine, 29 years, except my husband and my husband's family. <laughs> so it's that long and special um, of a relationship. Professor Levine, despite his, uh, well, counterintuitively at the time, and when I became a doctoral student in the year 2000, um, agreed to be uh, my dissertation chair. So the problem was that I did my dissertation, and I say this now with great embarrassment on postmodernism, whereas Professor Levine here is a professor of transportation. So when I would tell people that we actually have something to talk about, people would say that I'm just making this up. So it's very real. Um, it somehow clicked, and it has been clicking. So this energy, intellectual, has been clicking for, well, 30 years now. So I will not uh, spend time reading his extremely long biography, just a few highlights. Uh, like I said, uh, he's a professor and former uh, department chair of urban and regional planning at the University of Michigan, where he teaches transportation, land use, um, urban economics, and research design. He will present from his latest book, which is the same title you see, From Mobility to Accessibility, which focuses on the transformation of transportation, of the transportation and land use planning paradigm from a mobility to an accessibility paradigm, which will become perfectly clear to all of you after the, during the presentation, uh, which is co-written with uh, two other faculty members. Uh, uh, Jonathan, uh, and here's one little personal thing. So um, I have provided the car for all my kids, so I drive a car from the year 97. Don't, they don't let me touch the new cars. But I told my middle daughter that I'm hosting Jonathan. She didn't have to ask which Jonathan because she has, she has heard this so many times that there was no question asked and I was provided with the new car. So that's the only way it works. Uh, so you in my family are the Jonathan. So if there are others, they don't know. So it's the same daughter who, when I was working on my dissertation, she was the age of four. And I remember her sitting on the couch uh, and I asked her, Sophia being four and drawing something, what are you doing? And she said, she said this very uh, quietly because she wasn't sure it's appropriate for a child to say, and she said, mommy, I'm working on my dissertation. <laughs> and you know what? She's actually working on her dissertation. It's taking her 20 years. I mean, see, because now she's 24 and working on her dissertation. She started when she was four. So that's how she learned about the Jonathan. So anyway, this small personal introduction here, but on the professional stuff, uh, Jonathan is also the author of Zoned Out, Regulation, Markets, and Choices in Transportation and Metropolitan Land Use, a great book, I've cited it many times, which argued for transportation and land use policy reform on the basis of expansion of household effective range of choices rather than modification of travel behavior. His work has received many awards and many grants, including Best Paper in the Journal of Planning, Education, and Research, uh, Residential Fellowship in, Rock, in the Rockefeller Foundation Center in Bellagio, which is very competitive because I applied for it and he wrote me the letter and I still didn't get it. So very disappointing. Uh, and also other awards like the Association of Collegiate Schools of Planning and the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development Excellence in Urban Policy Scholarship, as well as the um, the, the award of the Association of Collegiate Schools of Planning in, back in the day, in 1996. So a, a, a very, very, really a very special day for us. So thank you so thank much you. for coming. Thank you,
Well, thank you very much, Sonia. Uh, that was great. Very heartwarming introduction. Uh, I, I happened to get a call from my sister as I was walking around downtown uh, Athens. And I said, oh, I'm in Athens, Georgia. What are you doing? And, and, and uh, she said, doesn't it blow your mind that a former student of yours is a dean? And I said, yes, it actually does <laughs> blow my mind that a former student of mine is a dean. Um, and Athens, by the way, I feel very much at home. Ann Arbor, kind of the Athens of the North. The differences I observe, obviously, weather is the obvious one. Um, I think you're a little older town. You see some older buildings, uh, your first colonies, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, the, the southern character of, of, the, of the place. Um, Sonia said it's, oh, I, I want to first start by acknowledging my co-authors, because this is, is based on our book, uh, Joe Grings, my colleague at the University of Michigan, and Louis Merlin, my colleague at Florida Atlantic University. Uh, Sonia said it's a special day. It is a special day. But for purposes of this talk, oh, I want to set a clock just a second. It's an ordinary day. Today is an ordinary day. You have your task list of what to do today. You have to get to work and back or get to school and back, maybe pick up your kids, maybe you need to go to a grocery store shopping. Only one thing is not ordinary about today. You get to choose between two cities in which to complete your task list. City A has destinations, origins and destinations that are quite close together but transportation is slow. The cars travel slowly, the buses travel slowly, even the bikes travel slowly. City B uh, has uh, destinations that are spread farther apart, but transportation is fast. Now I want to put in one more assumption, and that is you will spend more time and money filling your task list in city B than you would in city A. Okay, so in other words, close destinations with slow travel uh, and you save time and or money, far destinations with fast travel, but it, but it costs you time and money. So quick poll, which city do you choose to complete your task list in? How many would want to choose city A? Okay. How many would want to choose city B? Faster travel, even if you spend more time. Okay, vast majority, by the way, not 100%, okay? And that's the usual outcome, something like 90 plus percent. Maybe because I talk too much to colleges of architecture and urban planning <laughs> that have been pre-propagandized on this area. But what's bizarre about this is that what you know, and really the and the person in the street also knows about what they need from a transportation system is not what transportation planners believe they know about a transportation planning about a transportation system. They believe that they can assess the quality of transportation through the quality of movement rather than the ability to reach destinations. I'd like to give you one more uh, example of this. Uh, uh, this is a little bit more, well, both of these are stylized examples. You have uh, two commuters leaving work at the same time. Uh, they're both driving home. And note, by the way, I'm gonna be using driving examples because I'm not gonna be equating accessibility with walking, cycling, transit. Accessibility is a way of understanding what the benefits of transportation are. It's not any particular mode. So this is, they're driving home. Uh, they have to drive home uh, for, they drive home in parallel for 10 congested miles, after which time commuter A is at home. Commuter B, unfortunately for them, has to drive another 10 miles before they're home, but luckily for them, those second 10 miles are no longer congested. Now, it's a trivial question. I won't even ask for a straw poll. Who has the better commute? Of course, commuter A has the better commute. 
let's evaluate their commutes in terms of the standard metrics of transportation planning. Average speed, psh, commuter B has the better average speed. Percent of time spent in congestion, no, no, no contest. Commuter A spends 100% of their time in congestion. Percent of distance spent in congestion, same thing. Percent of time buffer required to ensure an on-time arrival, same thing. Uh, commuter A has to, has to leave a higher time buffer in order to ensure an on-time arrival. Only in the, the metric total delay are the two seen as equal, and in no commonly used metric in transportation planning, in standard, the, the standard practice of transportation planning, I'm not talking about progressivized versions of it, is the truth actually revealed? And the truth is, of course, commuter A has the better commute. What's going on here? It, the, really, both these stories are two versions of the same story. Uh, transportation planning, historically, and transportation engineering, and transportation economics have evaluated transportation performance through metrics of mobility, the quality of movement. What you and I know, and those two commuters know, is that's not what matters in transportation. What matters is the ability to get to your destinations. The difference is uh, your, your ability to get to your destinations physically is at a minimum a function of both mobility and proximity, and it's the proximity dimension that's left out of standard mobility-based transportation planning. The book, uh, my co-authors and I, are arguing for what we, what we term the accessibility shift. The accessibility shift, I'll use this term throughout, the accessibility shift is a shift in the methods of transportation planning and the transportation aspects of land use planning from a mobility to an accessibility basis. And hopefully by the end of the talk, you'll know exactly what we mean by that kind of shift. The points, uh, I have exactly three points in the talk. The points are that the shift is compelled by the very purpose of transportation. In other words, a transportation planning that is consistent with the very purpose of transportation, it's not an option. It must shift to, uh, it must engage in the accessibility shift or it is not consistent with the very purposes of why people travel. The second point is that the, that the shift would be very transformative in transportation planning and the transportation aspects of land use planning. Mobility thinking, mobility metrics, and mobility methods are shot through transportation planning for sure, but so much of land use planning is governed by mobility thinking as well. All of that is potentially transformable uh, through this accessibility shift. But that the uh, shift is impeded by a series of misconceptions about what accessibility is. I've hinted at one of those mis misconceptions already when I talked about cars versus walking and, uh, walking and cycling and, and transit. So let's, ta let's take these three things in order. Compelled, why is it compelled? The, it starts from the very purpose of transportation. So, so what economists will tell you is that the, d the demand for transportation is derived, that's economic jargon, for the demand to reach destinations. In other words, the reason people travel is in order to reach destinations. This is not 100% of travel. Sometimes we travel on a joyride. We travel for the sake of movement. But for the vast majority of our travel, we're traveling uh, for, the, uh, for the purpose of, of, destination, of reaching destinations. If that's the case, then I want you to imagine a policy that increases our ability to move, but decreases our ability to reach destinations. In other words, that, set, that city that was more spread out with faster traffic, but you have to spend more time and money reaching your destinations. Would that move be a positive step or a negative step in policy? And I would argue that move has to be seen as a negative step if we start from the purpose, the very purpose of transportation. But this is so different from the practice of transportation planning today. For all the, the efforts at making it a more progressive practice, uh, the, the mobility basis really remains largely un, unchallenged. Uh, 
I better, now you'll note that I haven't exactly defined my terms yet. What's mobility, what's accessibility? Um, good catch, I'm glad you noticed that. Uh, let's define terms, it's, it's actually really very simple uh, and the, I find that the best way to explain it is through what would count as an increase in mobility, what would count as an increase in accessibility. A mobility increase is an increase in the territory that one can reach for a given investment in time and money. So if we imagine ourselves that we're at the center of the blob, uh, we can reach any, any location within that blob or we can reach the territory that within, within that blob for a given investment in time and money. And by the way, note that I didn't specify by which mode. So mobility metrics would get down to the specifics. For example, uh, uh, how, uh, how much territory one can reach within a half hour of driving, as an example. By contrast, an accessibility increase is an increase in the destination value that one can reach for any given investment of time and money. So note that what I've done here is I put in red asterisks, asterisks to represent my destinations. Why do I use the term destination value rather than the term destinations? It's because not all destinations are created equal. Uh, often, as a, when we talk about work destinations, jobs, we often just count up jobs and we say, okay, a job is a job. When it comes to non-work destinations, uh, shopping, uh, social, recreational, et cetera, et cetera, clearly a convenience store is not, this doesn't have the same value as a supermarket, uh, so we'd have to talk about destination value. And there are different approaches and metrics to, uh, to categorize, ca categorizing destination value. But the point is that if the purpose of transportation is reaching destinations, then this accessibility shift would be compelled because it's destination, destinations, or more precisely, destination value that we're, uh, that we're trying to reach. So how do we do it? How, how, do we, how do we get to accessibility? And what's the role of mobility in this whole question of how we get to accessibility? Some people, uh, when they're around Levine, and they say mobility, they kind of say, ooh, they step back and they say, oh, no, 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 accessibility, as if mobility were a bad word. Mobility is most certainly not a bad word. In fact, mobility is a necessary component of accessibility. The problem comes when we confuse means and ends. So that, that's the intent of this diagram. Accessibility is the end, it's the purpose of, of transportation. Um, uh, mobility is surely one means. Proximity is another means to accessibility. And connectivity is a term uh, that we use to describe when things come to you as opposed to you going to, to, to the thing. So it, the things can come in bits and bytes. That's one way things can come to you. They can come to you in terms of conventional utilities. Uh, they can come to you in terms of Amazon packages. So that's another form of accessibility. I'm going to, or, or another means towards accessibility. I'm going to um, focus on physical accessibility, meaning the ability physically to get to a destination, which means that the left hand, uh, the two left hand means, mobility and proximity, are gonna be the important ones. So I'm not gonna be dealing a lot with connectivity, but I wanna put it in there as a placeholder because it, it, has, it has an important place in accessibility. Uh, what happens when we confuse means and ends? Well, I would argue bad stuff happens when we confuse means and ends. Let's imagine, for example, that we're gauging uh, agricultural productivity. And we say, oh gosh, we have a really good way of measuring ag agricultural productivity. We're gonna measure how much uh, fertilizer the, uh, the farmer used. Well, that would not be a good met metric of agricultural productivity. You might say the farmer needs fertilizer in order to produce crops, uh, but surely the amount of fertilizer is not a good indicator of the farmer's productivity. And moreover, 
if you can have the same amount of crops for a, a, a smaller amount of fertilizer, that actually would be better than having the same amount of crops for, the same, for a greater amount of fertilizer. Th this is an illustration, again, of this economist principle of derived demand. Economists would say the demand for fertilizer is derived for the demand for crop, for crop production. So it's an intermediate good or service along the way. And in the same way, uh, mobility is, der is derived from accessibility. So mobility is really only a means to an end. So the people who say, uh-oh, I'm around Levine, I better not use the M word, uh, are misguided because of should we avoid talking about fertilizer when we're, when we're around farmers? Of course not. Of course the farmers need fertilizer. Of course we need mobility. Of course that is, but what's the problem? The problem is when we evaluate success in mobility terms. Because when we evaluate, we, it's not merely retrospective. It's not merely how did we do, as I'll talk about uh, momentarily, it's also what shall we do? Uh, and, the, and mobility thinking uh, also determines what shall we do, surely in transportation planning, but also in the transportation aspects of land use planning. Uh, second point, the accessibility shift would be hugely transformative in, uh, in transportation planning and the transportation aspects of land use planning. And in a sense, there's some good news here. The good news is we we know very well how to incorporate methods, metrics, and frameworks based in mobility into our planning processes. I mean, that's really what transportation planners do all the time, and similarly what they do when, when, they, when they do land use planning. Uh, essentially, the accessibility shift is just a, a transplant onto a graft onto that, onto that uh, trunk. In other words, we have the frameworks uh, for, and for every metric model or method that's based in accessibility, there, in mobility, there is an accessibility analog. And all we need to do, and I'm going to put it in quotes because it's, it is a tricky thing, not so much technically as politically, all we need to do is to graft on the accessibility buds onto that existing, uh, onto that existing trunk. Uh, as an example, uh, highway level of service. Highway level of service is the way transportation planners grade a transportation facility uh, uh, or grade, the, grade an, the auto aspects of a transportation facility. It's a grade from A to F, uh, where A is totally free flow and, and F is uh, totally unpredictable travel and, and uh, uh, utterly congested travel. Um, uh, and it rules the roost in so much transportation planning. So what transportation planners will do will model and forecast level of service, and where level of service is forecast to be not acceptable, maybe the standard is C and level of service is forecast to be a D, the transportation facility gets a, um, uh, is targeted for a, an improvement, which is really a euphemism for widening. Uh, we ought not to use those euphemisms. We ought to be more descriptive about what we actually do. Um, uh, but here's the thing. That works if you treat movement as the purpose of transportation. Better or worse, but the logic is there. What if you treat accessibility as the purpose of transportation? Well, we know that transportation and land use are intimately related. And in particular, some kinds of transportation investments will tend to spread land uses. Some t type of transportation investments will tend to concentrate land uses. If you're a transportation investment that spreads land uses, then the degradation of proximity is going to partly or entirely reverse the increase in mobility in producing proximity. So put in regular English, if you build freeways at the metropolitan periphery and you get sprawl, 
uh, the, the greater travel distances are going to eat up your accessibility benefits. By contrast, if, uh, if you are an investment that has the transportation investment that has the characteristic of concentrating land uses, for example, some significant trans, uh, public transportation investments will attract concentrated land uses around them, then the, the, proximity, the enhanced proximity effect augments the mobility effect to pr produce yet greater accessibility than the, than the mobility effect produced alone. So what does this all mean? Keep on measuring mobility. Keep on measuring level of service. Of course we need that. But we need to ask the next question, and that is, combining with proximity, what is the accessibility effect? And that would lead, I think, to some very significant different transportation decisions. Some transportation investments that look like a solid winner today would not look like a winner, and, and it would boost the, uh, the prospects for other kinds of transportation investments. Uh, how about the transportation of aspects of land use planning? So I, I um, hit on this several times, and it's a really important point, I think, because so much of land use planning is governed by an by a attempt, often a futile attempt, to uh, control congestion through low-density land use regulation. So the prime, uh, the prime tool here is traffic impact analysis. So traffic impact analysis is, uh, let's say I'm a developer and I propose some denser development, maybe near uh, the center of town, or maybe near a major transit station. Uh, the planners will say, okay, uh, you're gonna have to hire some traffic consultants, and they're gonna do a traffic impact analysis. What the traffic impact analysis is gonna do is it's going to um, project how many seconds of delay you'll be adding to the traffic stream at the intersections in your vicinity. And we, will, we planners then will assess whether or not you're degrading level of service to below something, uh, some acceptable threshold. What happens if you don't pass the test? Uh, well, the, the moderate things will be, well, you better kick in some money to the fund that we're going to be using to uh, improve the intersection or change the signal lights. Or let's go up from there, uh, you're going to have to pay for widening the intersection. Or let's even go up from there, uh, you're going to have to reduce the density of your development. Or maybe, you know what, you just can't even build here because the traffic effects are too bad. Well, what happens then? Do the uses, whether residential, commercial, office, do they disappear? Well, no, they go elsewhere, they go farther afield. In other words, in, in your search for mobility, you're actively degrading proximity and probably accessibility at the same time. What's the remedy? Well, again, this is a, this is a case where we have a method or a metric that's based in mobility, that there's a perfect analog in, in, uh, in accessibility, and that is, Keep your traffic impact analysis. Don't throw away what we know about how to forecast impacts on movement. But allow that the development will have proximity benefits. Integrate those proximity benefits with your mobility costs. The problem with, with the metric as it's as it currently constructed is, again, uh, it only focuses on it, it's only, the only question in, for transportation purposes from that, from that development is how much worse will things be? There's actually literally no possibility for things to be better because it's adding trips, whereas you and I know that allowing X number of households to live close to their destinations or close to downtown or close to the, a major transit station is itself a transportation benefit. Um, I want to return to a point I, I mentioned before, and that is the modal dimension. Uh, you'll note that I've been talking about cars, and you might say, well, if you're talking about accessibility, why do you keep on talking about cars? And I have a particular strategic reason for keeping on talking about cars. Because mobility, neither mobility nor accessibility is an attribute of a particular mode. 
mobility or, and accessibility are both ways of, of assessing success via any mode. I will offer the following. There is a mobility way of planning for pedestrianism. And you might say, what? How can there be a mobility way of planning for pedestrianism? And the answer, I would say, is take a look in the Highway Capacity Manual. Look at how level of service for pedestrians is gauged in the Highway Capacity Manual. It's gauged entirely by the nature of the facility that's given to the pedestrians. Does the pedestrian have plenty of room? Is the pedestrian separated from the cars? Uh, can the pedestrian walk at speed, et cetera? It's all informed by the pedestrian's ability to move. Nowhere in the Highway Capacity Manual, in its description of pedestrian level of service, is, uh, is the notion that if, you can't, if there's nowhere to walk to, you're probably not providing a high pedestrian level of service. So there's a mo that's a mobility way of thinking about pedestrians. And I hope you realize that I've already talked about an accessibility way. Oh, let's see, going backwards here. An accessibility way of planning for cars. So in other words, if you integrate with your traffic impact analysis, uh, an, a an analysis of the, proxim the beneficial proximity effects, then you're talking about an accessibility way of planning for cars. What this leads me to the misconceptions about accessibility that I believe impede the progress of the accessibility shift. The accessibility shift faces an, a number of political impediments. Just to give you a flavor for one of those political impediments, um, I was speaking to somebody, uh, uh, a re retiree from the Michigan Department of Transportation, who totally is on board with all this accessibility stuff, and I said, okay, let's think about the director of the Michigan Department of Transportation. What would it take for him to get on board with, the accessi with accessibility? He said, oh, that's easy. He said, if he became convinced that accessibility were a way for him to get a lot of money to build a lot of roads, he would totally be on board with accessibility. That gives you a flavor for some of the impediments, uh, of political impediments to accessibility. So I'm not gonna address those, and those maybe are the stickier ones. I'm gonna address the, one, the conceptual impediments to accessibility, things that people think accessibility are that it just isn't, that I think also impede. So at least maybe from the standpoint of the com community of people interested in the built environment, planners, architects, designers, um, uh, transportation engineers, if we can at least ourselves get our house in order, maybe we have a chance against the broader political forces. So again, this f the first and, and probably major one is uh, accessibility, well, that's about bikes and, and walking, isn't it? And, um, and, and mobility, that's about cars. Well, no, it's not a mode. It's a way of, a, of understanding the success or the failure of any mode. Or more broadly, um, accessibility, uh, people will love to load up accessibility with all the things they want in transportation. So accessibility, it's not just, in, in this view, accessibility, that's my little angel on the side of transportation here. Accessibility is not merely uh, the ability to get to destinations. It's the ability to get to destinations in a safe, uh, sustainable, um, uh, socially equitable, et cetera, et cetera. Whatever you like in transportation, you stuff it into the accessibility box. So in other words, Mobility is, that's all the bad stuff, that's cars and highways, uh, and accessibility is all the, all the good stuff we want in transportation. That leads to, there, there was a, a quote from somebody who, who I would say is not sympathetic. He says, oh, I get it. Accessibility is the kind of transportation you like. Okay, that's what that kind of thinking justifiably opens advocates of accessibility up to. Here, and, and let me explain why I think we, th though we want lots of good stuff, we want equity and we want sustainability, don't get me wrong, we have to conceptually separate the resource from the distribution of the resource, okay? So accessibility is a resource, 
a valued resource. It's what people want out of transportation. Now that resource can be distributed either equitably or inequitably. If we conflate equity and accessibility and we say, well, it's not, it's not accessibility until it's equitable, then you're conflating the distribution of the resource with the resource itself. Uh, here's another way of kind of saying the same thing. People will tend to view accessibility as a market basket of stuff you do. Oh, I'm an accessibility planner, therefore I work on bike lanes. Well, wait a second, bike lanes. Isn't that the, about the ability of people to move by bike? Bike lanes would seem to be a, 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 a means of mobility. What the mistake is, accessibility is not, or the accessibility shift is not a market basket of things, but it's a rubric, it's a checklist, it's a, it's a kind of report card. It's a way of assessing your success. Why is this so important? Um, for some reasons I've already described, and I want to describe another, another reason as well. Uh, often people will equate urbanist strategies, density, mixed use, compact development, walkability, transit friendliness, uh, cycling friendliness, et cetera, with accessibility. Now I would acknowledge that those policies are probably accessibility increasing. And I say probably, note that, note that I put those urbanist strategies almost entirely within my accessibility strategies. There's, we can talk about theoretical instances where an urban, urbanist strategy might not be accessibility increasing. What's more, more interesting and more important is the opposite. Let's think of accessibility strategies that aren't urbanist. For example, think about a uh, a major job center that's 12, 20 miles away and accessible only by car. Now, in your mind, pick it up, move it to 10 miles away and accessible only by car. I don't think that would count as an urbanist strategy. Uh, it's, there's no way of getting there through any means other than, other than driving. Uh, it's, we're probably talking about suburban territory, et cetera, et cetera, and yet, that would be a significantly accessibility increasing move. The problem when we equate accessibility and urbanist strategies is we don't give credit for the full range of moves that would be accessibility increasing if they don't show up on our urbanist radar. Uh, here's another, uh, another way of expressing this misconception. I'm in the transportation plan planning business, so I can't think of, I can't count the number of times when I've heard accessibility and mobility paired. The purpose of this plan is to further accessibility and mobility of the population. Now, usually, by the way, when, when I look at that, I say, okay, let's look for definitions, and they're totally garbled. Whoever wrote the purpose of this plan is, is to improve accessibility and mobility of population can't actually distinguish between the two. If there is a distinction, Accessibility is that urbanist stuff and mobility is cars and highways. Um, what's wrong with this pairing? Well, first of all, where does it come from? It's actually, believe it or not, in federal legislation. Federal legislation says it, that uh, plans are required to uh, further the accessibility and the mobility of the population. So plans will echo that. But it's a nonsensical formulation. It grabs one end and one means and neglects two other means. And yet it sounds so symmetrical, accessibility and mobility. Uh, a, another, um, another misconception, uh, or uh, I wouldn't call this an, an error, but I would argue against this position, is viewing accessibility as valuable in instrumental, hence the Swiss Army knife, rather than inherent terms. Instrumental rather than inherent. What does that mean? So often we ask ourselves, okay, what does accessibility do? Does it uh, lead people to drive less? Oh, that would be a good thing for accessibility. Does it lead people to walk more? Oh yeah, that, if accessibility does that, then that would really justify accessibility. Does it lead people to get more physical exercise, maybe lower their BMI? That would be a really good thing for accessibility. 
Without denying that all of those things are good things, I think we need to be able to distinguish the cake from the icing on the cake. Yes, if accessibility brings ancillary benefits such as reduction in car use, uh, that's actually a pretty good thing. Uh, what if it doesn't? What if there are circumstances when accessibility doesn't bring in a reduction in car use? Is it necessarily a bad thing? Let me give you a little scenario. You're a transportation planner and you're routing a, a new transit line and you have a choice. You can route it through a, a rich neighborhood or route it through a poor neighborhood. And you're thinking about reduction in vehicle miles traveled. What should you do? Well, the answer actually is pretty clear. Route it through the rich neighborhood. That's where the vehicle miles traveled are. That's where car ownership is high. That's where car use is high. You have to have a target before you can reduce the target. In the poor neighborhood, people drive a lot less. They own cars less. They, they, uh, they can afford to use them less. So if, ve if vehicle miles traveled reduction is your goal, sure, route it through the, through the rich neighborhood. If accessibility is your goal, route it through the poor neighborhood. Why? Because even though you'll be reducing car use less, you'll be increasing mobility, uh, increasing accessibility more because, as I said, the poor people, uh, the cost of car ownership and use is much more of a burden for the poor people than is for the rich people. So the incremental increase of that, of that transit line would, uh, would be much better, which would be much greater in accessibility terms in the poor neighborhood. Uh, so here's the thing. If we view the purpose of accessibility as something, as if we view accessibility as something instrumental, for example, to reduce car use, that would lead us to, to decisions like routing the transit line through, through the rich neighborhood. Now, reducing car use is an absolute environmental imperative, global environmental imperative. Don't get me wrong about that. But it's a different goal of transportation planning than the fundamental purpose of transportation planning. Essentially, uh, car use, um, VMT is, is some indicator of the environmental harms of transportation, but is in no way indicator of the benefits of transportation. When we think about the benefits, we have to think in accessibility, accessibility terms. Uh, which leads to this, to this, this next point. Accept, what's the relationship between accessibility and, and reductions in vehicle miles? traveled, I actually believe that overall the accessibility shift is very consonant with reduction in vehicle miles traveled, but as I indicated, uh, there certainly may be times when accessibility and vehicle miles traveled, uh, are, are reducing vehicle miles traveled, is, are at odds. What should we do in those situations? And the answer is the accessibility shift doesn't answer the question for us. It merely allows us to ask the question in the right way. The question has to be answered through the planning and the political process. What about um, uh, maybe, ex maybe accessibility is about actual revealed travel behavior. Okay, M instead of going through all this accessibility measurements, why don't we just measure, for example, uh, how long people drive to work or how much time people, people spend in, in uh, traveling to work? The answer, the answer to that is that does not indicate the benefits of the transportation, or I should say the land use and transportation system to individuals. So uh, some of the shortest travel times to work are, for example, for people who live in downtown Washington, DC, with many, many, many destinations with a, with a, within walking distance or with a very short travel distance. You can find identical travel times to work in rural Kansas in parts of rural Kansas. Identity, like to the decimal, the exact same travel time to work. Why? Because if you are gonna be employed, there's nowhere to travel except for something that's very local. The latter, the people in rural Kansas derive much less value from the, from the land use and transportation system because they're able to reach fewer destinations. So this simple question about could we substitute in actual travel behavior for this potential for interaction and the answer is that wouldn't capture the value of the that the transportation system is offering. 
why does this all matter? Uh, when, uh, when we wrote the book, our editor said, um, you know, I'm just a little worried. You're, this, you're treating this, this whole accessibility thing as an axiom. It's like true by definition. Um, and I'm uncomfortable with axioms. And I, I said, okay, that's great feedback. We're actually not treating it as an axiom, but if we need to fix up our writing to make sure that we convey that, that we're not, then thank you for that, for that point. It's not something that's true by definition. It's true because empirically we observe how, how individuals behave, how people behave, and what they want out of a transportation system. Uh, and it's true because of the people and their behavior and their desires. It's not true because it's uh, abstractly true in some axiomatic form. Ultimately, what's a planning system about? It has to be something about what people want out of their built environment. So ultimately, it's about a system that aligns the professions of transportation planning, transportation aspects of land use planning, with the desires of individuals to make sure that ultimately the planning serves more of its purpose. And with that, I'm very happy to take any questions.